Well, let's begin session three. Have we lost the culture? Why Christians should care? Here with answers to those questions is John Stone Street. All right. Hope you had a good lunch. We'll try to keep you awake here this afternoon. It's always dangerous to jump into a a session after everybody's belly's full. Well, here's the question. After what we talked about this, this morning, uh, there could be a, uh, uh, okay, so what do we do? I mean, the, the force of the sexual revolution, what it's done to religious liberty, what it's done to our understanding of what it means to be human, uh, what it's done to so many different aspects and agencies within the culture. Like, it, it, you know, it's pretty formidable. Uh, have we lost? Uh, a couple years ago, and I think this book might be out on the table, I'm not sure, but a couple years ago in 2013, I joined with my friend Sean McDowell. You might know Sean's dad, Josh McDowell. Uh, Sean and I are friends, and uh, he's an apologist and a professor at ba uh, Biola University. And he and I um, decided to write a book on same-sex marriage. And people often ask, like, why would you write a book on same-sex marriage? And I say, well, you know, I'm hoping to make some more friends. And... Um, you know, thought that would really help. And no, it, actually, this was in 2013. This was before the Supreme Court decision giving us same-sex marriage or forcing same-sex marriage on us as a nation. But what we realized is that even though same-sex marriage wasn't here legally, it was already here culturally. Uh, you know, and there was a couple of vignettes that really proved that to us. And we said, look, this is something that we've got to be prepared for as Christians. So the book's out there. It's, a, it's an introduction to the issue. A lot of the questions having to do with, should I attend a same-sex marriage? How do I stand for traditional marriage in a culture that now has legalized it? All of these sorts of questions we wrestle with. So it could be a helpful book. Um, but as I was writing that book, I traveled around, talked to a lot of different people uh, about the issue. And I, I remember uh, specifically talking to a pastor of a state out west. And this was a state in which they had a marriage amendment, uh, amendment that was actually passed by the people, surprisingly in this particular state, uh, defining marriage as between a man and a woman. And a judge, uh, an activist judge, like what happened in so many states prior to the Obergefell ruling, basically ruled that unconstitutional and with the stroke of a pen for same-sex marriage on this state. And this pastor was very discouraged. Now, for the record, he had been in the battle. Does that make sense? So there's a level of respect that, that people deserve if they're not on the sidelines, but they're actually in the game. And this guy was in the game. But I remember him looking at me, uh, have, this having just happened in his state, a lot of his efforts, he'd spent years and years and years mobilizing, arguing, articulating, uh, trying to lead people to this sort of uh, uh, you know, to, to help them understand what marriage is, why it mattered. And it just had been kind of flipped on its head and overnight. And he looked at me and in great despair, he said these words. And it's a question that I hear a lot uh, in the work that I do talking about culture. I think especially before the last election, um, which it's in interesting because if you had the question before the last election, not now, then it says a lot about how you understand the church and how you understand culture moving. But, but here's the question. Uh, it, or here's what he said to me. He said, John, it's over, we've lost. That's what he said to me. John, it's over, we've lost. And I hear that a lot. Uh, have we lost the culture? Is it too late? Is there anything that can be done? And, and there's a lot of different views on this. And so I want to jump into this. Let me give you a punchline right off the bat. I think when it comes to culture, Christians do a lousy job understanding the culture, by and large. And the culture does a lousy job understanding Christians. All right. I'm going to give you just a, a vignette that, that helps explain that. I think it was mentioned earlier. I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Anybody have visited Colorado Springs? Yep, God's country out there. Uh, stay away. we got too many people moving in. So um, <clears throat> Colorado Springs is a great place to live. And it's known for having a lot of religious organizations. That's one of the things we're known for. In fact, the last time I saw this reported on in the newspaper, it said that there were something like 3,000 501c3 nonprofit religious organizations in Colorado Springs. 3,000. And that's everything from the multi-million, actually almost billion dollar organization like Compassion International to the Christian Cowboy Association. In fact, there's three Christian Cowboy Associations. They had a split. It was really ugly. And, <laughs> and everything in between. I mean, we joke that, you know, we're the Mecca. You think Wheaton's the Mecca? No way. We're the Mecca of evangelicalism. You're not a real evangelical until you have taken a pilgrimage to Colorado Springs and you've gone down the wits end slide at Focus on the Family 
and yeah, that puts you in the, the movement, right? And, and so that's the town we live in. Well, we moved there in 2007. And in 2007, a few months before we moved there, there was a pastor at a large church that had a big fall uh, morally. And uh, a guy named Ted Haggard, if that rings a bell. Okay, so uh, the new pastor came in to what is the, really the largest church in Colorado Springs. And he, um, he said his job was to get that church out of the media spotlight. And he was able to do that just for a few months. In fact, it was about three or four months after we moved there, driving around on a Sunday morning, looking for a church, had the radio on in the van, and, uh, in our minivan, and there was a news flash that came across the radio. There's been a shooting at New Life Church. Do you remember when this happened? It was a 20-something-year-old uh, young man, mentally ill, and he drove to a YWAM base in Color uh, Denver, outside of Denver, shot two people when they answered the door at 2 in the morning and killed them, then was armed with uh, hundreds and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, planning to kill a lot of people, he pulled into the parking lot as the 11 o'clock service was letting out. He shot two people in the parking lot, shot two people in the door of the church, and a security guard for the church who said that she had heard from the Lord that morning that she was going to have to do something. Um, that's what she said. She shot him and killed him right there in the door of the church. So we're driving around that morning, and we're hearing this come across the radio. We're hearing this report. And of course, when a shooting first comes across the radio, it's chaotic. They don't know if it's still going on, if it's still active, if there's one shooter or two shooters. So there's a lot of information they didn't know, but because we knew the church and knew the town, we kind of tuned in. And suddenly the woman who's a news reporter says, we have someone on the phone who saw some of the shooting take place. Now, I don't know the details of it, but apparently this guy saw the first two people get shot in the parking lot. He panicked, ran down the hill, flagged down a car, drove away, and whether he called into the radio station or the police station first, I'm not sure. I just know that I'm listening to this interview. And this woman's trying to get information from him, and so she asks him, um, was mass still going on when the shooting took place? Now, New Life Church is a large, charismatic mega church. They have a rock band on Sunday mornings, smoke and mirrors, and this woman says, was mass still going on when the shooting took place? And he replied, huh? And she said, was mass still going on when the shooting took place? And he said, huh? And she said, was mass still going on when the shooting took place? And he said, huh? And she said, was mass still going on? I started to count. This went back and forth eight times. Where this woman, who is a news reporter in the mecca of evangelicalism, didn't know enough about Christianity to know they don't have mass at New Life Church. This guy didn't know enough about what was going on to even know what mass was. And it was a complete ridiculous exchange. Now, to me, it was just kind of an ev evidence that when it comes to the relationship between Christians and the larger culture, it's always a struggle, but it's particularly a struggle now. Now, there's a whole lot behind that. And one of the things we do in our Colson Fellows program that I told you about is we talk about the history of ideas, just like we talked about the history of the loss of what it means to be made in the image of God, uh, the history of the sexual revolution. There's a whole history, uh, especially in the last 150 years. It's like the perfect storm of the struggle between Christianity within Western culture, particularly American Western culture, and what's happened. And there's a whole story to this. But where that's brought us to is a place of real confusion. I want to sum up what I think that confusion is with really two things. I'm not going to talk about the culture's confusion with us. Uh, that's, that's one part of it. And we spend a lot of time yelling at the culture for how they get us wrong. And they do get us wrong. Every Easter, uh, Terry Mattingly at the religion, uh, at the, uh, uh, I forget what his organization is, but he talks about all the ways that uh, the, the press at Easter completely misreports uh, Christianity. Uh, like, you know, last year, Easter is when Christians celebrate uh, uh, you know, when Jesus ascended into heaven, right? That's not what Easter is about. Uh, Easter is about the resurrection. After he died, he ascended into heaven. Now, you missed an important part, which we celebrate, which is the resurrection. And we haven't necessarily kept that part quiet. So you really should know about that, right, when it comes. So we can make fun of it. My favorite one of all time was when the New York Times talked about a Catholic service and talked about the crow's ear. And they spelled it crow, like the bird, crow's ear. Now, the crow's ear is the cross that you carry up the middle of a service in a liturgical worship service. So it's actually spelled C-R-O-S-I-E-R, -E crozier, and they spelled it crow's ear. That's really funny, okay? 
we could go on and on about that. I don't want to talk about that. One of the things I appreciate about Chuck Colson when I first met him is that he realized something that we all need to realize. We can spend all of our time complaining about what's wrong in the culture. Let me remind us, creation, fall, redemption. The problem's not just out there, the problem's in here. And listen, it's not just kind of a theological issue. We've got, we, listen, we've got, we've got a lot of our own house cleaning to do. When, in fact, in our book on same-sex marriage specifically, one of the things we say is, look, we could get every law passed on marriage that we want to right now, and marriage would still be in lousy shape in America. I'm not saying those laws don't matter. I love the fact that we have Christians in the legislature. And I commend uh, especially those of you that are legislators in the, exactly in these crazy states like Illinois. Thank you for your courage, and especially the ones willing to stand up. Um, we have too many people that say one thing before they go to office and another thing when they go to office, uh, including on this last, was it HB 40? Is that what it's called? Whenever I hear that, wasn't there a band called HB 40? UB 40. That's what it is. Thank you. That's bothered me since Thursday night. So thank you for solving that problem. Um, I, I'm, I'm like those dogs in Up. You ever see that movie Up? It's like squirrel. You know, that's kind of like how I am. So forgive me. I've been wondering that for three days. Um, but, um, uh, but, but uh, a lot of the problem is, is ourselves. And I want to identify two problems when it comes to our influence and our relationship with culture. The first thing is, is that we have gotten lazy and sloppy in defining culture. And so for many of us, when we talk about culture, what we mean is all the bad stuff that happens in the world. It's the synonym for the culture, as if culture is out there, as if culture is all the bad things happening in America and we don't have culture. That's not precise enough. And the reason is, is because culture is not good, nor is it bad uh, in, in the fact that culture exists. The problem isn't that we have culture. The problem is the direction that culture goes. If we go back to our kind of walk through Genesis, it should be obvious in those early texts that culture making was one of the things God created us to do. We're actually supposed to make something of the world. And so let me offer you a better definition of culture than all the bad stuff that happens in the world. A better definition of culture would be something like this. Culture is what humans make of the world. It's the environments, the worlds that humans make of the world. Whenever people get together, there's a culture. Culture is kind of the sum total of the products, the ideas, the institutions, the services, uh, the, the, the sort of world that we create. That's why when you leave one cultural setting and go to another cultural setting, you oftentimes notice how different it is, right? So I took my, uh, middle uh, my oldest daughter with me to Australia a couple years ago. It was a great trip. Had an opportunity to go down there. And we landed early in the morning. We hop in a taxi. We go to the, uh, the hotel. And what's the first thing that she says? Any guesses? What's the first thing that she says? We're in a taxi driving to the hotel. She said... They're driving on the wrong side of the road. Now, they're not driving on the wrong side of the road. They're driving on the right side of, uh, well, you know what I mean, right? They're driving on the right side of the road for that culture. It would be the wrong side if we drove on the other side, right? In other words, and that's not right or wrong. That's just culture. That's the way you order the world. You produce an environment wherewith, wherewith you can live together. That's not good or bad. I took my uh, middle daughter this past year to the Dominican Republic. And um, she said, Daddy, it's like a different world down here. And that's exactly what people do. So when we talk about the culture as if it only happens out there, really, Christians don't have culture? Have you been to a worship service? It is not normal, right, for, for, for people typically to do the sorts of things, like to just put money in, in plates as they go by, right? That's not a normal behavior for most Americans, right? It's Saturday. Look outside. The trees are budding. It is beautiful. It was 22 here last Saturday, I heard. Is that tr correct? And you guys are sitting in a room listening to me. There's something wrong with you, right? Uh, why are you doing this? Because there's a culture of conferences and that sort of stuff. So we, the, here's the thing. The question isn't, should we have culture? The question is, which direction culture has, uh, has taken? So let me give you a theological idea that will help us make a little bit better sense of it, uh, hopefully, than misdefining culture. It's, here's the concept. I'm going to get you, write it down, and then um, 
Let me give you the theological concept. Ready? Here it is. Structure versus direction. Structure versus direction. Now, uh, here's what we mean by structure. When God created the world, as we already said, God created the world and he said, it is what? It is good. All right? The idea of the way God created the world, and because part of the way God created the world was by giving humans the capacity not just to consume from reality, but to produce reality. We create ideas. When people get together, that's the sort of stuff we do, right? Um, we, we produce ideas and, 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 and laws and institutions and little worlds. And, 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 and that's a good part of the world. It was structurally good. And part of that goodness was that it was for God's glory. When humans did what humans were created for, it was for God's glory. The problem is, is that we've misdirected what was structurally good away from God's glory to either our own glory or to the worship of false gods. Does that make sense? The problem is throughout history is we tend to confuse structure and direction. When I was growing up, there were complete aspects of culture that were considered wrong structurally because they were directionally bad. That's the mistake. Anybody grow up in an environment where going to a movie theater itself was bad? Right? Because there were bad movies. Clearly, there were some movies that were bad, but it made structurally that institution bad. Or playing cards is always wrong. Anybody kind of grow up in that? Now we're going way back. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, it's, it's true. It happened, right? This is, a, this is wrong when we structurally condemn something because it's directionally bad. Make sense? Here's an example. Leadership is structurally good. The capacity for influence, structurally good. Tyranny and dictatorship is directionally bad. Sex is structurally good. It's a good gift. This has been a mistake throughout the history of Christian theology. There's been theologians who kind of saw it as bad. No, it's good, right? Homosexuality, adultery, lust, pornography addiction... This is making something that's structurally good directionally bad, right? So we should not, when we say, for example, the culture, as if it's all the bad stuff out there, we're structurally condemning something that's directionally bad. Does that make sense? Do you guys follow that? Okay, that's been a really helpful thing for me. And I hope it's a really helpful thing as we get in a little bit further and say, how can we make a difference in the culture? Now, that's the first part. The second, second part of my kind of explanation here of how Christians misunderstand the culture is that I think we often ask the wrong first question. When we look at culture, we oftentimes approach it with the wrong first question. The most common way that we've kind of approached culture, I think, in the last several decades, and one of the things that's created some of this issue, and it reflects that we have a problem with structure and direction, is the question, where do we draw the line? When I was growing up, it was all about where do you draw the line? You, just, you draw the line between movies and between songs and between institutions and between aspects of culture. And everything on this side of the line is good because it's Christian and everything on this side of the line is bad or because it's secular, right? This is Christian, this is worldly. This is sa uh, sacred, this is secular, right? So when I was growing up, you know, Christian music, good. Rock music, bad. But then someone came up with Christian rock music. Man, we didn't know what to do. It was really confusing, right? And remember, going to movies was, was bad, right? But then Billy Graham started to make movies. He started to use movies to share the gospel. Now we have credit. Then we figured that one out, right? If Kirk Cameron is in the movie, it's good, right? Um, listen, I think we all have to reach a point where we ask that question, where do we draw the line? You've got to say yes to some things and no to some other things, right? We can't participate in every activity or every cultural good in a culture that is directionally taken their God-given capacities away from his glory. But I don't think it's the right first question. I think there's a better one. And I want to introduce it to you. I wish I had thought of it. It comes from my friends at the Acton Institute. The Acton Institute's over in Grand Rapids. They do uh, some great work. And they put out this little film series a couple years ago called For the Life of the World. 
And the, the film series was based on a question. And, and I love this question. And I want you to think about it. What is our salvation for? What is our salvation for? Let me explain to you what I mean. I think we have spent, and we often spend question, a lot of time in theology and churches and discipleship programs, asking and answering the question, what is our salvation from? And you know what? That's good news. We should spend a lot of time on that because we've been saved from sin. We've been saved from death. We've been saved from the wrath of God. We've been saved from hell. Amen? Like if that's all there was to our salvation, you still should take that deal because that's the best deal you'll be offered. Or we might spend time talking about maybe what is our salvation to? It's to heaven. It's to eternal life. It's to the fellowship of believers. It's to the glory of God. In Christ. And that's a lot to talk about. We should spend a lot of time talking about that. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about what is our salvation for. What are we saved for? And what I mean by that is if we're saved from sin and death and hell to eternal life in heaven, why are we still here? Right? I mean, think about it. I don't know about you, but I was asked. Uh, I want, uh, sorry, I, when I was growing up, I wondered a whole lot of things about God. I had these tough questions about God. One of them was that one, is that if the whole point, because sometimes I got the impression that salvation and the gospel was about being saved, and if that was the point, why doesn't God just take me to heaven the moment I'm saved, right? Because if he just takes me to mo heaven the moment I'm saved, then I don't struggle with that sin. I don't struggle with that person who makes me sin. And then I hit puberty, and I was like, wait, wait, not yet, you know? And so it was this real struggle. Some of you know what I'm talking about. So... It was this real struggle, right? I thought that was a lot funnier than you guys did, apparently. <laughs> Anybody else wonder that question? Like, why doesn't God just take us to heaven the moment we're saved? Yeah. And the thing is, I found the answer. And the answer, right, is blame it on Jesus. No, seriously, it's his fault. It's Jesus' fault. I, 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 I want to point you to John chapter 17. Anybody know what's going on in John chapter 17? The high priestly prayer of Jesus. You need to study this. This is the most important prayer in the Bible. It's not the prayer of Jabez. It's the prayer of Jesus. God the Son talking to God the Father the night before the pivotal event of all of human history. Okay? And he prays a lot of things. First of all, if you've ever studied this prayer, he prays for two groups of people. The first group of people are his disciples. The second group of people are those who will believe because of the disciples. Who's that? That's us. So Jesus prays for us. Isn't that amazing? And he prays all kinds of things. But everything he prays serves the purpose of the first thing that he prays, which is, Father, glorify the Son that the Son may glorify you. Because you've given him authority uh, over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you sent. Right? So let me kind of outline it here for you. Everything else that Jesus is going to pray in the course of his prayer is to serve the first and primary purpose that he prays, which is that God would be glorified. And the way that God would be glorified is that Christ would be glorified. And the way that Christ would be glorified is by giving eternal life. And the way you get eternal life is that by people knowing him, right? And so that, in other words, Jesus is praying that people would know him. And by knowing him, they would have eternal life. And by having eternal life, they would glorify the Son, which would glorify the Father, which is the whole point of reality in the beginning, Right? And he prays a lot of things. And in the middle of this, here's what he prays. Father, do not take them out of the world. Interesting, this is right after he says the world's going to hate them. He says, Father, don't take them out of the world. Protect them from the evil one. Now let's do the math. That by being in the world, somehow, that serves the purpose of us knowing him. And by knowing him, it actually serves the purpose of the, Jesus being glorified because of giving eternal life, and that glorifies God, which is the whole purpose of reality. So the reason you don't get taken right to heaven when you're saved is because somehow Jesus thinks you being here is the place to know him and to glorify him. Isn't that interesting? I want to, I want to tell you a story that helps me kind of wrestle through this idea of what is our salvation for and why we're still here. 
dealing with this trouble and all that. It's the story of uh, a brother and sister. If you go to the National uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and you go through the main exhibit, right before you go out the door, the, uh, at the end of the exhibit, there's a whole wall, room there with a big wall. And on that wall is a, basically a tribute to the Gentiles that stood up for the Jews. And it tells stories. There's thousands and thousands of people who did the right thing during the Holocaust. One of the stories is about Hans and Sophie Scholl. If you have older children uh, that are in high school and you want a movie to watch with them that will really spark some fascinating discussion, the movie is called Sophie Scholl, S-C-H-O-L-L, The Final Days. And it tells the final days of Sophie Scholl, her and her brother Hans Scholl, and really Hans led this. They grew up in a typical German home. And what I mean by that is a German Christian home where Christianity was more cultural than it was Christian. It was the sort of Christian home in Germany that would eventually walk lockstep, literally and figuratively, or at least remain silent in the face of the Nazis. And so that was the home they grew up in. But they went off to college. And while they were at university, they were mentored by some professors. And these professors really knew Jesus and loved Jesus. And their faith in Christ started to grow. And as their faith in Christ started to grow, and it became real, not just cultural, then what happened is they started to see that there was a collision course between what they knew about Jesus and what they were seeing from their own nation. And so they felt like they had to do something. Um, and so over a period of several years, Hans and Sophie Scholl, with a group of other students and a faculty advisor, they led a, um, a student resistance group. It was all anonymous, clandestine, underground, and they published a series of pamphlets or tracts, and they distributed them around the university campus. They mailed them to nearby homes, documenting the human rights abuses, the tragedies, the bad military decisions, uh, all the things they could about the evils of the Nazi uh, Reich. Uh, of course, they had to do this all anonymously. When they were doing their sixth and what would be their final distribution, they uh, were on the university campus. The students were in an assembly. They were trying to scatter these papers all over the campus. The assembly was almost over. So Sophie Scholl saw a stack of the, the papers. She took them to the top of the university tower. She pushed them over so that they scattered across the campus. And a janitor spotted her and turned her in for littering. Well, within four days, they had been brought in for littering, and that had turned into an accusation of treason. They had been convicted, or they had been tried, accused, and convicted. And within four days, Sophie Scholl, Hans Scholl, and another student were uh, beheaded. They were executed by beheading. It's, uh, it, it, it's an unbelievable story. Hans Scholl had a motto. And Steve Garber in his book, The Fabric of Faithfulness, talks about this motto. And it goes something like this. We are Christian. We are German. Therefore, we are responsible for Germany. Chuck Colson used to do a lot of uh, projects with a guy named uh, Richard John Newhouse. Richard John Newhouse founded First Things. And one time he wrote an article in which he got into some trouble. Because he said in this article, and I quote, when I meet God, I expect to meet him as an American. <laughs> what could go wrong with that one, right? People were like, what are you talking about? So he got in trouble because people were saying, wait, are you saying that God's an American? No, that's not what he was saying. Are you saying that the only way to meet God is if you're an American or it's better to meet God if you're American? He wasn't saying any of that. And he went on to explain it later. All he was saying is he didn't choose to be an American. He's an American and it's part of who he is. And that when he meets God, that'll be part of the conversation they have. Hans Scholl was saying something like this. We are Christian and we are German. Therefore, we are responsible for Germany. For Hans Scholl, it wasn't an accident that he found himself in Christ and found himself in country. That actually God was determining this. In fact, I want to point you to a passage of Scripture. Not John 17. It's the next book, Acts 17. There's a lot of things in Acts 17 that Paul writes. Acts 17 is when Paul is talking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill. And what he's doing is he's invited to describe to a bunch of people who just love religions. They love to talk about philosophies and ideas. They don't have any sense of Judea, the Judeo-Christian worldview. And they invite, um, uh, uh, they invite Paul to actually talk about this. And Paul tells you a lot of things about God. A lot of fascinating things in that passage. Here's one thing right around verse 24-ish. Here's what Paul says. That the God who made everything 
determines the exact times that people live and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Did you pick up on that? It is not an accident that you find yourself in this time and in this place, in this culture and not another one. God wanted you in this time and place. He didn't want you in another time and place. This is what Hans Scholl means when he says, I'm Christian and I'm German. The fact that I'm Christian and the fact that I'm German is not accidental. How many things could we put in that? In fact, if you're taking notes and you're writing this down, which I think is fascinating, write it down like this. I am Christian and I am blank. What would you fill into that blank? What are the details of your life, personally and culturally, that you didn't choose? Now realize God chose them for you. And the fact that you're Christian and you're male, the fact that you're Christian and you're this race or that race, the fact that you're Christian and you live in this cultural moment, the fact that you're Christian and you're a boomer or an Xer or a Gen Z, or I think is the next one, right? None of these are accidental. How would you write it? I'm Christian and I'm Illinoisian. This is really easy if you do it in Texas. I'm Christian and I'm Texan. Therefore, I'm responsible for the universe. You know how Texans are. It's just really obnoxious, right? Right? But this is the question. God determined that we should live in this time and in this place. And not in another time and not in another place. And somehow, for Han Scholl, that implied responsibility. I'm going to skip through this for time's sake. It's really awesome, but <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you'll get it. Oh man, there's even a Bonhoeffer quote, but I'm running out of time. So let's, let's wrestle with the question, what are we saved for? Let me start here. We can say, uh, before we say what we're saved for, let me say what we're clearly not saved for in scripture. Here's what we're clearly not saved for. We're not saved for escape. There are escapist religions. If you want an escapist religion, you can find one. Buddhism is an escapist religion. And what I mean by that is not, I'm not trying to be, um, uh, you know, disrespectful. It's actually the system. Like, the point of Buddhism is basically to remove yourself from desiring anything in the world. And when you remove yourself from desire, then you remove yourself from suffering. And so the whole point of Buddhism is to escape suffering by escaping desire. It's an escapist religion. Uh, uh, Hinduism is an escapist religion where the entire point, like the goal of Hinduism is to escape physical existence through a cycle of reincarnation. You do it better each time. You come back as something else until eventually you stop you escape the cycle of reincarnation and you join the fabric of all things. And that's the whole point of Hinduism. It's an escapist religion. Um, Oprahism is an escapist religion. That's my word for kind of what passes for a lot of American Christianity, what passes for a lot of American religion, which is it's this personal, private way to make your own life better and to escape the negative. You focus on the positive. If you focus on the positive, then the universe obeys you and only gives you positive things, and then you get good parking spots at the mall at Christmas, right? So this is uh, escapist religion too. Christianity is not an escapist religion. It is not. It's not part of the system. And let me just say this for a couple reasons. It's not part of the system because try as you might, you may want to escape religion, uh, culture. You can't as a human. I think escapist religions are unrealistic. You can try your best to escape culture. It doesn't actually happen eventually. This is my, I told you about my kiddos. This is my, my girls. This is what they actually look like most of the day. Uh, and then this is their little brother here uh, who uh, is, is just about to turn one. And I learned this early about my kids. You can try to keep them safe from culture. And we're conservative about what comes in our house, what music we listen to. But you know what? Like it or not, the thing is, it happens, doesn't it? Right? I mean, when my daughter, my middle daughter was like four years old, I'm flipping pancakes on a Saturday morning. My wife puts on a CD and it's uh, Bless the Lord, Oh My Soul. You ever heard that song, Bless the Lord, Oh My Soul? Right? And 10,000 Reasons, right? And, and my middle daughter, Anna, out of nowhere, at age five, she pipes up, Hey, Daddy, is that Justin Bieber? <laughs> We've never had a Justin Bieber song play in our house. I don't know where she heard his name. So we spanked her, and I'm, I'm just kidding, we did that. But it's like, what on earth, right? You can try to keep the culture out. You can't, but I'm making a different point, right? My different point is not just that you can't escape culture, but that it's not part of Christianity. It's not, right? Now, before I get into why, 
let's admit something. We actually have a reputation for being escapist as Christians. It's not just from our culture, it goes back. So for example, the great atheist Friedrich Nietzsche said that there were two great European narcotics, alcohol and Christianity. Now you know what he's saying. What does alcohol do? Or what does a narcotic do? It numbs you and it dumbs you and it keeps you distracted. He thought that's what Christianity was. Very similar to what Karl Marx said when he said religion is the opiate of the people. Right? Very similar to what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said. He said, it does, what does it matter if one is free or slave in this veil of tears? The essential thing, he's kind of critiquing Christians here, is for them to get to heaven and resignation is one more means towards that. True Christians, he said, are made to be slaves. They know it and they're not concerned by it. This short life is too unimportant in their eyes. So you see, the critique here is that Christianity is about getting to heaven. And if it's about getting to heaven, then what happens on this earth is going to blow up anyway. And so therefore, we shouldn't care about the culture. Now, you could say, well, wait a minute. I don't think Nietzsche's right. I don't think Marx is being fair. But sometimes we talk like this, don't we? Sometimes we act like this. One of the great preachers, revivalist of all time, who's pretty well known in this city. Is that okay to say this? He said that caring about culture is like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Is he right? And sometimes we even talk like this. Now, I'm going, to give, I'm going to quote here my favorite song that I disagree with. Is that okay? Like my favorite hymn even. And this is dangerous because we're in church and I'm about to say a hymn is wrong. And it's difficult to sacrifice the sacred cow in public. So I'm going to say for the record, I actually really love this hymn. I love it personally. My mom used to sing it. My grandma used to sing it. But see if you, if you recognize it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know this song? Isn't this beautiful? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in it. I know some of you are like, well, wait a minute. I, to, not that one, right? You're like, you're like, you can't make fun of that one. I'm not making fun of it. Again, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Amen. I completely, yes. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. My only thing I disagree with is the third line. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Here's the question. Is it true? Is it true that when you focus on the Lord, the things of earth become dimmer or the things of earth become clearer? Is the point of our walking with the Lord to distract us or in the words of Frederick Nietzsche to numb us and dumb us from the things around us? Or is it to make us care about them in the right ways? Is it that we love Jesus so that we don't love anything that's happening on earth around us? Or is it more like St. Augustine said, which if we love God, then it properly orders our love so we know what to love and what not to love and how to love it. Now, don't trust me, right? Just because I, I don't think this song is right. I want to tell you why I think she's wrong, why I think Christianity is not an escapist religion. I'm going to walk through a series of arguments. Ready? Here's the first one. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, all things were made by Him. Sorry, this verse 3. And without Him, nothing was made that has been made. Verse 4, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, and the light did something. What did the light do? Shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Have you ever been out on your front porch on a really dark night and flip the porch light on, what happens? Does the dark rush into your house or does the light rush out into the yard? Listen, if you live in a house and the dark rushes in, you need to move. <laughs> like immediately, they make movies about your house, you always die, you need to move. No. In fact, I'm not just proof texting John 1 verse 5. If you know about John, that prologue sets up what he wants you to know about Jesus. John wrote a different sort of gospel than Matthew, Mark, and Luke did. He didn't talk about, he spent, 
half his book on three years and half his book on one week. He picked, handpicked seven miracles and seven discourses or sermons from Jesus and the thing he wants you to know. And he then takes it into his epistles and even into the Revelation. The thing he wants you to know is that light overcomes darkness and life always defeats death. I don't think when we walk with the Lord, the things of earth grow dim. I think when we walk with the Lord, it gives us a focus, a perspective, a clarity about life in the world. But let me give you the other reason I don't think Christianity is escapist. Because the center of our religion is exactly what we just said. It's then down in verse 12 of John chapter 1. And the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. That's not a proof text either. In Jesus, Paul says, is the Godhead fully revealed. And what that means, not only physically, that he makes himself known, but it actually reveals in Christ, ultimately, the trajectory of God to the world that he made that's revealed from Genesis all the way to the new heavens and new earth. And that's this. The trajectory of the Christian story of the universe is not God pulling his people out of the world. It's God coming and walking with his people through the world. God comes and walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. He personally deals with Cain. He actually walks with Enoch. He chooses, uh, uh, he calls Noah out and, and then comes and reveals himself in the, um, in, 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 the, in the rainbow. He actually comes and calls out of the poly. poly Theus family, this man Abram, and makes of him a great nation. And he walks with him out of Egypt as a pillar of fire, a pillar of God. He indwells the tabernacle, right? He comes through the words of the prophet. He fully comes in Jesus. Even when Jesus goes away, he says, it's good that I go away because I'm going to send you what? God the Spirit. Do you see how this happens? In fact, from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the maps, what happens is God comes and, and walks with his people. And the only time he stops is in the new heavens and new earth. That's the only time he stops. And that's not because that's when we get out of here. What you find out is ultimately the end of the story is that God brings heaven to earth. And here's what, what it says. Jesus says, behold, I make my dwelling among men. The reason God stops visiting his people in the new heavens and new earth, he moves. Praise God. Isn't that really amazing? So that's the trajectory. The, tra the trajectory of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Oprahism is escape. The trajectory of Christian is that God comes and walks with us. And let me give you the third reason I don't think Christianity is escapist. Because when God created humans, he told them to do stuff with the world, to make the world a better place, to turn the wilderness into a garden. And he said, it is very good. And what Jesus is doing in redemption is not different than what God is doing in creation. It's a restoration of what God intended in creation that's been frustrated by the fall. It's a one storyline, not two storylines. So you put all this together, escapism is not an option for Christians. Compare the words of that hymn with this one from Matty Babcock. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. and the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. And I don't know about you, but I need to hear this third verse over and over and over. So will you read it out loud with me? Ready? This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, what? And all God's people said... Aren't you glad that God's never looked down at the chaos of the Supreme Court, an election season, a state going crazy, a family that's breaking down, a, a health situation that, that's, that seems out of control, that, and a financial collapse. God never goes down and goes, ah! God never goes, ah! Wouldn't it be awful if God went, ah? This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let earth be glad. We, one of the things we talk about, in fact, it's the opening chapter. The other book that I think that's out there is Restoring All Things. Is there some Restoring All Things books out there maybe? I don't know about that. But one of the things we talk about, and it's vitally important, is that Christians must always keep straight the story and the moment. And I hope you can see how I'm trying to do that here. We live in a cultural moment, and there's a ton of crazy happening in our cultural moment. Crazy to the point, again, as I said, where we're denying physical reality and saying everything will work out fine. 
But we can never turn around and say the story is up in the air because of the moment. Praise God, he gave us the story. So we can't understand the story from the moment. We can only understand our moment from the story. D does that make sense? We can never rethink and say something's out of control. And that's what I love about Maddie Babcock's song. It's a recognition that no, all will be well. All things are made new in Christ. And this is the story. That's how I understand the chaos of the moment. And here's what, where that takes us to. Ready? It is never, ever, ever true for a Christian to say, I get the emotional impulse, I get the frustration, I get the sense of chaos. It is never true for the Christian to say, it's over, we've lost. It just never is true. Two things from the mo about our moment that we can know from our story or from the story that we're given. And, it, and it's fascinating. Easter is the best time to think about this. In fact, the first thing is what we say to each other at Easter. Now, if you're Eastern Orthodox, you'd say it to each other all week or every week. And I'm not Eastern Orthodox for theological reasons, but I tell you what, I like that. They look at each other every week. We look at each other one weekend out of the year on a Sunday morning in Easter, and we say what? He's risen. He's risen indeed. The Apostle Peter, it's fascinating. How many of you guys knew there's a book about joy, an epistle about joy? Anybody know that? Who wrote that? Paul did. Yes, yeah, the book of Philippians. Where was it written from? Prison. So the book of jail is written from prison. Or, sorry, the book of joy is written from jail. That's what I meant to say. Wow. Did you know there's a book of hope? It's a book that talks about what hope is. And punchline, spoiler alert, um, hope is not a feeling. Hope is not a wish for things to change. Biblically, the book of hope talks about hope being a certainty in something that has already happened. But it's, by the way, it's the book of First Peter. And Peter wrote that book to a group of Christians who were facing increasing levels of intolerance and persecution under Nero. And that, that means they were about to head into the crazy time under Nero of persecution. Look, I don't know if God has a sense of humor, or, you know, but he gave us the book of joy from prison. He gave us the book, book of hope from persecution. And guess why Christians not only can be hopeful, it basically says there's no such thing as a Christian who's not hopeful. I mean, Peter's like, I, I don't really mean that, like we never have to think, but Peter's pretty clear. It's what Chuck Colson used to say, despair's a sin. Father Newhouse wrote it this way, the Christian has not reason, uh, right to despair because despair is a sin. And the Christian has not reason to despair quite simply because Christ is risen. So when we say Christ is risen, what we, what we don't mean is that I think Christ is risen or he's risen to me or I believe in him. No, no, no. Whether you believe it or not, Christ is risen, right? And that's it. Like, put your feet there. That's where hope comes from. The second truth, and Peter actually connects these two in his sermon at Pentecost. I, I've been looking at this. Soren Kierkegaard has this really wonderful quote um, that really reflects our experience. He says that... Um, Life is lived forward, but only understood backwards. Right? You've had that experience, right? Where you walk into a season of chaos. Well, what, what I love about the Gospels and Acts, especially if you put Luke and Acts together and read it as one book, uh, is that you get to watch the disciples live life forward and then understand it backwards because they're walking into Holy Week not knowing it's Holy Week, right? It's chaotic, it's crazy. Things, their expectations are blown apart. They have one thing they think God's gonna do. He doesn't do it. Christ doesn't take over the Romans. They don't know what's going on. They run away, right? All that stuff. And then you have Peter in the same town right, who turns around and preaches that Christ is risen, and he gives us the punchline after walking through it. Here's the punchline in his sermon at Pentecost, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So the first truth of our moment is that Christ is risen. Peter says the second truth is that Christ is Lord. And that's crazy, because you remember just a couple weeks before that, before the crucifixion, right, you remember what, the, what, the, what the, uh, the Jews said to Pilate? Like, we have no God, we have no Lord but Caesar. And to that same crowd, Peter turns around and says, Christ is risen, Christ is Lord. He's saying, do you see he's saying the exact opposite? Where they were saying, you know, Jesus, we have no Lord but Caesar. When Peter sang it, he's saying Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. He's telling them all they got it wrong. This is like, I don't know if you've ever seen Dead Poet Society. This is the first barbaric yelp 
of the early church. Christ is Lord. And it's not I think Christ is Lord. Get this. It's not even Christ is Lord of my life. No, no, no. Christ is Lord. He's not Lord whether you think he is. He's Lord whether you think he is. He's just Lord. That's just the reality of it. And that's where Christians stand in the moment. That's why, as you said, I don't know how you said it, but hope is secure. It's not up in the air. Christ is risen. Christ is Lord. And I think you take those two things and you add in the third thing, which is Christ has placed us in this time and place. So you do the math. What are we saved for? So if we're not saved for escape, let me say one more thing before we take a break, uh, take a quick stand-up break. I don't want to get into how we can make a difference. Let me also say this, that we're not saved for accommodation. This is what we're being told. This is what we're being told by a lot of individuals. And that is, you've got to get on the right side of history. No, it really, if it, you're, you'll be swept into the dustbin of history. Um, if you don't change your beliefs on fundamental things, then um, you'll, you'll, you'll get in the way of spreading the gospel. People won't come to Jesus because you'll be too great of an offense. Now, I, I want to hit this kind of accommodation thing on two levels. The first one, I'm probably going to get a lot of amens on. second one, I may not get as many on. The first one is, look, there's no such thing as the wrong side of history. There's only the wrong side of right. There's just not. And if we're living out of the story, not the moment, I spoke to a group of um, uh, college students last year at a Christian university. It probably costs, I, I don't know, typical Christian university, somewhere between thirty and 40000 a year to go there, all in. So we're talking about a group of students that maybe spent $150,000, $160,000 to get their education. And I told them, I said, you know, you need to realize that you may have just spent $150,000, $160,000 to learn a, a skill set so that you could get a job where the most significant thing you could do to follow Jesus Christ is to get fired. This is the pressure that, that many face. Um, and, and see, the, the lie that we hear is that if you don't accommodate here, then we'll, you'll get in the gospel over here. I want you to hear what this basically says. And I owe this thought to my friend Owen Strand. He, he put it this way. He said, that's like saying that God's morality gets in the way of God's gospel. God's morality doesn't get in the way of God's gospel. That's one way we can accommodate is to try to change our beliefs, to try to be more palatable. Sometimes we do it with our methods too. And there's a couple examples of this, but Chuck Colson talked about this over and over and over. And I'm going to revisit something I said earlier, which is if that question, have we lost, if the thing that changed it for you, if you are asking, have we lost under the last presidential administration, but you're not asking it anymore because of the election, then you're guilty of accommodation. I'm not saying, by the way, that I don't think things have changed. I think um, this is a hard question. We can maybe talk about it more in the Q&A. There, there's a lot of, I think, I think, um, to say that character doesn't matter in a candidate is, is, is inconsistent and inaccurate. Character does matter in a candidate. I am thankful, on the other hand, that the top priority of this administration's both foreign and domestic policy isn't integrating restrooms. I mean, that was like the, you know, I, I think it's something that the Obama administration historically is going to have to live up to. as the first African-American president um, and um, spent almost his entire second term of his administration putting all of his eggs in the LGBT basket. That's something I think it has to own up to. Um, I, Trump's going to have to own up to things as well. But here's the fear. It's what Chuck Colson used to um, talk about a lot. And he was quoting a quirky uh, French theologian named Jacques Ellul. And it was called the, uh, he, uh, he coined this term called the political illusion. The political illusion thinks this, all problems are political. Therefore, all solutions are political. The political illusion thinks that if our guys are in power, things are good. If our guys are not in power, things aren't. And that's all there is to look at. The political illusion looks to the next election for salvation. Here's what Chuck Olson used to say. I love this line. Salvation will never come in Air Force One. I'm not saying politics don't matter. Get involved in politics. 
In fact, in just a second, I'm going to say, listen, way more important, I think, than even national politics right now is local politics. But there's another conversation. But the problem is, is if we think that, that, that power is the way to bring the kingdom of God to bear on every aspect of life, then we have accommodated to the spirit of the age, which puts everything in the hands of government, everything's in the hands of politics, and so on. It's just not true. It really isn't. And it's ignoring all kinds of other aspects of culture uh, that affect day-to-day -day life. So there's all kinds of ways that we accommodate. So if we are not saved for escape, and if we're not saved for accommodation, what are we saved for? And I'm going to argue we're saved for what we were created for. And if we were saved to, to engage in the world and to make the world what God intended, that's what we, if we were created for that, we're saved for that. Now, I think it takes on different dynamics, especially after the fall and especially because of Jesus and because of what needs to happen to the human soul in order to put them back on God's team and God's agenda. But that's what I want to talk about next. Okay, does that make sense? So we can use the word engagement, but I want to take it a little bit different than just kind of get engaged in culture. We don't engage in culture so we can win the election. We don't win the election so we can win the culture, right? We do culture and worldview stuff because it's part of Christianity. To be a Christian is to be culturally engaged. Why? Because to be a Christian is to be a redeemed human, and to be a human is to be culturally engaged. All right? So that's the story. That's how it all holds together. And I want to talk about what that looks like in an age where to be a Christian is not only to be considered quaint, outdated, unpopular, maybe even some situations evil. How do we do this well? All right.